Legend of Total War here, and today we're doing another tier list using Tier Maker, this time covering every single current playable faction in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires and rank them based on how powerful they are in the hands of the player. But before we get started in the actual tier list itself, I do need to let you guys know that this video here is sponsored by Manscaped. So you guys know I've been with Manscaped for a while now, love the product, love working with them, and their latest product, the Handyman, is an electric razor that's given me the closest shave that I've ever obtained from an electric razor. In fact, I've been able to shave my entire beard in under a minute using this product. I absolutely love it. And on top of that, I've come onto live streams having recently shaved, and you guys have been commenting on the freshness of my look. Because sometimes I come on looking like a bit of a bum, but not after I've used the Handyman. So check out Manscaped. Link in the description and get 20% off plus free shipping. Big thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Okay, with that being said, let's get into the tier list itself. So there are 92 factions in this game. So going and spending like a minute on each of these factions will bloat this video out of control. So I'm going to go through things fairly quickly. It's also really important to set down a criteria as to what I'm judging these guys on. So the main thing that I'm factoring into their strength ranking is how quickly it takes any one of these factions under an average sort of circumstance with an average player to reach the point of critical mass. The point where you feel like you've won the campaign, where the AI is no longer giving you any real challenge, and that you're able to project yourself on the campaign map without anyone really standing up to you. Some factions will be able to get to that point very early on, like turn 30. Some factions struggle a bit and take about 100 turns to reach that point. Every single faction in this game can certainly get to that point, that's not an issue. And it's also important to distinguish that overpowered factions under the hands of people who don't know what they're doing will get poor results. And underpowered factions under the control of players that really know what they're doing will get really good results. So you're going to get different results depending on who's actually playing the game. But what I'm going on over here is just based on average, based on their overall mechanics, what makes them strong, what makes them weak. What I'm going to do is talk about any particular race, cover the races one at a time. Uh, talk about what makes the particular race strong and then place the individual members of that race in a particular spot and then talk about them. So with the Beastmen, I think the Beastmen is one of the strongest races in the game to get to that point of, of critical mass because you don't really care that much about holding territory as long as you get your Ruination tokens. It's very easy to do that. They thrive on Mayhem and they can create a lot of Mayhem very easily. All their Legendary Lords are quite good. All their mechanics like the Dread mechanics, their Ruination tokens, how their economy works, all of this is really solid. They've maybe had a little bit of a nerf since Warhammer 2, but they're still one of the most powerful races in the game. In terms of their placement, I'm going to put Kazrak at strong, Malagor as average, Morgor as strong and Torox as overpowered. The reason for that is, I'll start with Malagor. Malagor has probably the weakest start position. He's a powerful lord, but he has actually gotten quite a bit of a nerf since um, since Warhammer 2. He's no longer the amazing spellcaster he used to be. Now he's still a good spellcaster by any means, but he's no longer able to cast like 500 spells, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, but also, the enemy that he has to begin with, he just he's not able to chain as many victories as what the other guys can do. The enemy tries to avoid you. Um, and so getting yourself to that point of superpower takes a little bit longer with Malagor just because of your star position. As, as a, in comparison with the uh, Kazrak One-Eye and um, Morgur, they've got a lot more uh, numbers of enemies to deal with which and very quickly, so they can pound down on them um, quickly and get their get their power up, because you need to fight battles in order to get Dread, or else you really can't do anything with the Beastman. And of course with Torox, him being able to just keep resetting his movement over and over again, while it's been nerfed since Warhammer uh, 2, you can still chain massive amounts of Rampages together, and his Dread rewards will give him a, a complete edge over everyone else. He can get to the point of no return way quicker than everyone else in his race. Now, as for Bretonnia, this is a middle-of-the-rung faction that's kind of struggling, I think, a little bit at the moment. Uh, they've been in a bit of a weird place ever since they've lost access to their walls and minor settlements. They're a strong late-game faction, but in the early game, they, they suffer a fair bit. And the early game is very important. So, I'm going to put Corona as average, Carcassonne as average, Bordaloo as weak, and... Um, Rapance as average. The reason for that is their start positions are okay, they're close to each other for confederations, close to allied Bretonians, where this guy is quite isolated. I also think that Lustria is not really a great place 
to be moving a cavalry based faction to be fighting field battles so i just think that bordelo is just going to struggle a little bit more in their campaigns compared to the other ones you can get better results out of these guys here but uh, they're not going to be as quick to get things going as these guys at all then we've got the chaos dwarfs chaos dwarfs confederate in the later stages of the campaign it's very easy to do it you just spend your conclave influence and then just instantly confederate them they usually all three of them survive sometimes they don't but they usually survive strong factions have got a really good roster because they've got cheap early game units and then really good later game units which you spend your um with your armaments on the uh convoy mechanic works quite well getting your um resources around they've got very powerful items very powerful mechanics they're very good at defending their settlements as well as long as it's actually a minor settlement or walled city siege battle so overall this is a very strong race their legendary lords are also quite powerful but i think that of the three zatan the black is the weakest so in terms of all three of them i'm gonna put them all three under strong i don't think any one of them belong in actually no you know what i'm gonna put the legion of asgore as overpowered because they've got an edge over the other two drazoath the ashen is by far in my opinion the most powerful of these three legendary lords his faction mechanics uh means that he can recruit better units cheaper uh because he's got reduced armament costs from it he's got a lot of enemies to begin with but that's not necessarily a problem so i think that these guys here are borderline overpowered, by the way, but I think that uh, that the Legion of Asgore has an edge over them. After after him, I think that the Disciples of Hashut are the next strongest, but all three of them are pretty pretty much on similar tier. Then we've got uh, Daniel the Demon Prince, who I think is underpowered. This guy has just not had a good time ever since Warhammer 3 was first released. Uh, his starting position sucks. He starts next to Malice. He's got a army roster full of demons, so it gives him a lot of variety, but the thing is, most of the other factions around him also have access to those exact same units, and are kind of better at it. Uh, like, for example, Archaon and Sigvold are fairly close to him. So he just, and Belakor for that matter, um, and he starts really close to Malice Darkblade, which is difficult for him to deal with. His faction mechanics of getting the demon dress-up game, it just hasn't hit the strides that it should have. And I think that this can this faction is just really lacking in terms of projecting its power on the campaign map. That's not to say that it can't do it, but I think that this faction really needs some extra mechanics to work for it, because it's a very bare bones mechanic at the moment. Then we've got the Dark Elves. I still think that the slave mechanic for the Dark Elves is letting them down significantly. It's mainly due to the public order problems it causes. These guys don't have enough uh, global public order bonuses, especially on the higher campaign difficulties, to compensate for that. And so I think that they're suffering a little bit. They've got very powerful armies and powerful mechanics for sure, but they've also got a lot of drawbacks. And I think there's big differences between uh, the worst of these positions and the best. So if we start with Malekith, I actually feel like Malekith has an underpowered uh, campaign because he has way too many enemies around him. He, he really struggles. A lot of people are complaining about Malekith's campaign at the moment. Now, that's not to say that a competent player can't absolutely dominate this campaign, but I think on average, people are going to find this to be a real struggle, uh, especially because you've got Torox to the south, you've got Grombrindel to the west, you've got Valkyr to the north, uh, you've got Sigvold coming down at you as well. You've, you've got um, Hellebron, who's not that cooperative near you as well. And... Um, your economy just, it struggles a little bit with Malekith. Uh, it's not the we not by any means the weakest faction in the game, but I, I really do think that of the Dark Elves, he's kind of getting the, the raw end of it at the moment. Now, as for Marathi, her situation has improved significantly over Warhammer uh, uh, 2, where the her star position doesn't get zerged at quite in the same way from the uh, Orth 1 High Elves. So, um... That's good, but also, instead of having Chaos Corruption as her as a type of corruption now, has Celeste Corruption, and it provides public order bonuses with no downside. So that's very good for her in order to offset the slave problems when you get into the late stage of the campaign. So that's very good for her. Hellebron has a bit of a struggle. She's got a similar start position as Malekith, uh, and she's got to deal with Sigvold and, Mal and um, Valkyr, so that's a bit of an issue for her. Overall, I just don't think that these factions really uh, hit their stride very early on. Uh, unless, of course, you're using exploits, which I'm not taking into consideration here. Um, I think that Lockyer Felhart, however, is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Everything just works really well for Lockyer. 
Obviously, the slave mechanic still sucks for him, but him having access to being able to recruit loads of black arcs, that's what gives him the edge over everyone else, because you can recruit a whole bunch of black arcs, recruit armies into them super cheap, send them around the world to just plunder, and you just sort out your economy that way. So you'll never be short on slaves, you'll never be short on money, you'll never be short on enemies either. And so I think Lockyer has got the best campaign out of the... Uh, the um, the Dark Elves. Also, when it comes to Confederation, Dark Elves are very pain in the ass to Confederate. They just don't want to do it. Even if they like you, they just refuse to Confederate most of the time. Uh, Malice Darkblade, his campaign, I think, is better in Warhammer 3 than it was in 2, but I'm going to put it under average. Uh, you know, starting off in the Northern Chaos Waste, not that much going on there. You do also start off with Hag Reef, uh, but Malice is a very powerful Legendary Lord, and his main campaign mechanic of his, like, potion thing um, is better now than it used to be, although it did used to provide public order, which was useful, uh, so he's got to compensate with that some other way. I don't recommend picking up the Sword of Cain, by the way, with any Dark Elf faction, especially if you're playing on higher campaign difficulties. It's, it really can cripple your campaign. And then we've got um, um, Rakath. I think that his star position is probably the easiest out of all of them, except for maybe um, Lockyer. But yeah, he starts off in a nice tucked away part of Lustria, not at war with any dangerous opponents early on. You've got access to you know instant monster armies. You can do a fair bit uh, with uh, Rakath getting things going. And also, because you're close to a trade lane, you can go to Cathay and go and meet with uh, Lockyer very early on if you want. So that's with the Dark Elves. As for the Dwarfs, I think that this race is sort of middle of the rung. Uh, not weak, not too strong. They've got a sort of easy-to-use infantry-based roster that relies fairly heavily on artillery. They're strong in order resolve, which gravitates, I think, newer players to playing as them. But being strong in order resolve can be a bit of a drawback because the AI will oftentimes send more force than what they actually need to win the battle. And when you go into the fight the battle manually, uh, it's difficult to overcome those odds because these guys, uh, they just have a, a difficult time overcoming overwhelming odds, especially in the early stage of the campaign. Later down the track, when they've got access to organ guns, flame cannons, that kind of stuff, uh, they can do it a lot a lot easier, but it does take them quite a while to do that because of growth issues. In terms of confederation, it's not too bad with them. Uh, you just got to catch the right timing with them. Diplomacy between the dwarven factions is is usually reasonable, but sometimes they will declare war on each other. You know, they're a grudge-filled race, so if you declare war on the wrong person or get on the wrong person's nerves, that can that can sour relationships for hundreds of turns if you're not careful. So as for Thorgrim Grudgebearer, I'm going to put him under average because I think his start position is fine. He starts off with a with a, a fairly rich starting province, but you've got a fairly dangerous enemy to deal with right off the bat in Skarsnik, and also in um, uh, Wurzag, the Great Green Prophet. So, sort of average uh, overall strength there. Sort of moves at the moves his campaign along at a sort of average level. Takes a little while to go with them because, like I said, uh, growth is a little bit slow with them, which is what you'd expect. Same sort of thing with. With Karak Kadrin, not the richest starting province, but I also think he's got easier enemies to deal with. Dealing with Azag in the early stages of the campaign, I think, is easier than dealing with Skarsnik. And then dealing with Vlad is not too difficult, because Vlad is usually busy doing other things. Uh, rolling around with loads of Slayers actually works quite well with Karak Kadrin. Then you've got Belagar. Now, Belagar's got some powerful units to begin with, especially with his ancestor heroes. But the biggest thing that cripples him is the 50% extra upkeep cost until you take Karak Apex, which a really competent player can take it very early on. But the average player is probably not going to manage that, and he's got a lot of obstacles to get in there. So that's going to be a big, ankle, a big chain around your ankle for quite some time. And he also starts off with a minor settlement. And he starts close to Ikit Claw, and he starts close to the Wood Elves. It's, it's not it's not going well for him uh, with um, with Belagar. Now, once he's overcome all of those problems, which usually takes quite a while, then Belagar hits his stride. But that's the case with every single faction in this game. Every single faction in this game, once they hit the late campaign, they just go rolling. But the early campaign is the bit that really matters, and his early campaign drags on a little bit. Now, as for Grumbrindle. Even though he starts near Malekith, he doesn't really suffer the same problems that Malekith does, so I'm going to put him under average, because I think you only really need to deal with Malekith and Val uh, Valkyr playing as um, Grombrindle, and because you start off with an edge of the map, your starting location is actually quite secure. So I think he actually starts off with a good start position, and the units that you use in that area are quite... Sorry, your units in that area perform quite well uh, against the Dark Elves. So I think that his campaign is you know, 
average sort of uh, power projection there. And as for um, uh, Thorak Ironbrow, I'm going to put him under strong because he has just got an edge over the rest of them, having Karag Zorn, a rich start position, um, fairly weak early game enemies, and also having his uh, relics to obtain, giving him an edge over the others. So I'm going to put him under strong. Typically speaking, DLC or FLC characters are usually going to be ranked higher because they've got some sort of special bonus over the generic ones of their race. Okay, then we've got the Empire. So Empire Confederations are a little bit weird. Um, it goes like this. These two confederate via Imperial Authority. These two are always confederated under Diplomacy. And these two are confederated under Diplomacy when playing as these two. So their economy is pretty good. Their early game roster is kind of bad. They have loads of enemies to deal with. And I'd say that the Empire is sort of due for a little bit of an update. I think the biggest thing that holds them back is the Imperial Authority mechanic, which is only something that these two here have to worry about. Now, in terms of Reichland, I'm going to put it as weak because starting position is quite challenging. It's ranked as one of the, the campaigns you should try first if you're new to the game, which I do not recommend it for newer players. There's, there's ca other campaigns that you should try first because you've got to deal with the Secessionists, you've got to deal with... Kazrak One Eye, you gotta deal with Festus the Leech Lord. Even though Festus doesn't start right next to you, Festus destroying Hockland is a problem. And then he moves over and destroys Ostland or Middenland straight after that. You've got to deal with Festus right away. It's a huge problem because if you lose your Imperial Authority, it spirals out of control. You've got the Deceivers causing problems in Sterland now. You've got Vlad von Karstein always being a problem. You've got Draka always being a problem. And you've kind of got Kislev being a problem. Because when Ostermark gets destroyed, Kislev goes and occupies it. And you kind of want that gentleman back. And it can be difficult to, to, to get them to do that. And then, of course, you've got Norsker invading. You've got um, you've got Belagor, uh, sorry, Bela, Belagor invading. Uh, strong diplomatic prospects with other Autotide factions. But overwhelmingly strong enemies to deal with. It's the exact same problem that um, the Order of uh, the Golden Order has as well. Now, um, the Hunts Marshall Expedition has a bit of an annoying mechanic in terms of the threat, having that Lisbon army constantly show up, but at least that it can be turned off now at some point in the campaign. So that's actually good. I'm going to put it under average because I don't feel like the Empire performs particularly well in Lustria, but I feel like not having the access to the Imperial Authority mechanic is just a big benefit. And also they do get access to a lot of uh, like uh, free units that come supplies in um, to sort of compensate for having to deal with those, those Lizardman armies that annoy you. But the threat mechanic is very annoying. Uh, then we've got the, uh, the Cult of Sigma, which is actually in a really strong position, I think. Their faction mechanic with the Books of Nagash is quite good. The bonuses are good. Uh, your starting area is quite rich. Your starting enemies are not super dangerous. Um, it uh, depends on, of course, if you put an endgame crisis in right there, then, then you're in serious trouble. Uh, but overall, I think that that Volkmar is in a pretty strong position for the Empire to be the, the headline, um, headliner uh, faction for it at the moment. Okay, then we've got Cathay. Cathay, I think, is in a pretty okay state. Um, in my campaigns playing as them, it's fairly easy. You can conquer all of Cathay with all three of these guys very quickly. They don't have an Imperial Authority mechanic to deal with, and the number of enemies in Cathay is not that bad. They've got uh, Snitch to deal with, which is obviously a problem. They've got Lockyer Felhart, obviously a problem. Nakai is sometimes a problem, and then that's not basically it. Uh, except for Village. Village is... Um, can also be a problem, but they've got nowhere near as many problems as what the Empire has, and I think they've got more mechanics to deal with their problems than the other guys do, and plus their economies does seem to be better, I think, than Reichland, and they're also really good in terms of establishing a lot of trade agreements because you send the caravans out early on to make a lot of cash and also to meet people to, in order to trade, so that works out quite well for them. So in terms of Miao Ying, going to put her under strong. Xiao Ming, put him under strong. Even though he starts off with a minor settlement, he does get Shang Yang pretty early on. That's very easy to do. But Yuan Bo, I'm going to put him under overpowered because uh, his faction mechanic gives him an edge over them easily. It's very powerful. The more battles you fight as well, the, the better it becomes. And you have your fingers in the pipe in both Lustria and in Cathay in the early stages of the campaign. So you can sell your starting province to make a boatload of cash or you could try to actually conquer Cathay from your starting position and either objective is uh, perfectly legitimate so I think Yuan Bo is 
quite overpowered at the moment in terms of his uh, factions. Really, really powerful campaign. Then we've got the Greenskins. Oh, hang on. Um, these guys here, in terms of Confederation, they used to have a really hard time confederating each other. It's not so bad these these days. You just need to sort of wait for them to get into either a few wars, which is almost guaranteed to happen, or wait for a, a Legendary Lord to get wounded, and then they're usually free to confederate. So I find that confederations work pretty well for them. As for Greenskins, confederations are super easy. All you gotta do is find that Legendary Lord and bash him in, into the ground, and then you get their entire faction. Works really well. So... Uh, as for Grimgore, I think Grimgore is in a really strong position in Warhammer 3. I'm going to put him under strong. I feel like with the Greenskins, their economy is good, their army roster is good. Being melee focused is fine in Total War Warhammer 3. They got access to the Wars, which for some reason I don't think the AI uses them. Uh, and as in the actual war in battle. Uh, the war mechanic on the campaign map giving you access to even larger armies is good. And their enemies are um, usually quite easy to deal with and getting loads of plunder that way. But yeah, their economy and the supply lines being um, toned down a bit really helps the Greenskins. As for Azag, I think Azag's kind of in an average position there. Not quite as uh, not quite as um, strong of a position as, Green as uh, Grimgore. As for um, Skarsnik, I don't think it really matters that much that he doesn't have access to Orc units because in all honesty, Goblins are kind of better, especially Nasty Skulkers. So I'm going to put him under average as well. Um, as for... Um, Wurzdag the Great Green Prophet. I think he's actually in a pretty good position in his campaign because he's fairly close to Grom the Paunch and fairly close to all the other ones. So he can get those confederations probably quicker than the other ones. He's sort of in the middle. So I'm going to put him under strong. And also he's a very powerful legendary lord. Getting a whole bunch of uh, savage orcs very early on with him is very powerful. And then we've got Grom the Paunch here who has is the only DLC... Actually, he's not the only DLC... Um, Legendary Lord for the Greenskin, but he's the most recent DLC, uh, DLC Legendary Lord for the Greenskin. And he's got a very powerful mechanic that's actually been reused multiple times now in uh, Grom's Cauldron. I would consider putting him under Overpowered, I think, because he's definitely more powerful than these two, but I'm, I'm kind of, like, torn between it. I don't think he's as powerful of a faction as these, but I think he does deserve the position here as overpowered. He's got, he's got a lot going for him, uh, Grom the Paunch. Very powerful legendary lord and start position in, in Bretonia. You've, you've got a lot of options in what you want to do. You can really pound down the Bretonians quite quickly. Then as for the High Elves, this is a very powerful faction. They're not quite as powerful as they used to be because their economy got nerfed. And confederations are a little bit more challenging than they used to be. It used to be super easy to confederate the entirety of the High Elves. You still can do that, but it takes a little bit longer than it did before. So I'm going to put Tyrion under strong, because strong roster, strong economy, not as strong as it used to be, but still strong economy, um, really strong in diplomacy, really good faction mechanics, good faction bonuses, good legendary lord, you got a lot going for you playing as the High Elves. The, um, the Order of Lawmasters, however, I'm going to put it under weak, because your start position sucks. Being close to Zinch is a big problem. You're going to have to fight Kairos which means invading the Chaos Waste, which either means blowing up the Chaos Waste settlements or occupying them. I guess you could occupy them and then just sell them to Oxyodal, but doing that will basically hamper your um, expansion compared to if you had an easier opponent opponent to deal with in the early stages of the campaign. The main opponent for the other High Elves is, is like Nakari, which is way easier to deal with, but you're basically on your own dealing with Kairos, and that's a big problem. So that's what makes him weak, in my opinion. As for... Um, Alariel, I'm going to put her under strong as well. Pretty similar start position and, and challenges as Tyrion. As for um, Nagareth, I'm actually going to put Nagareth and Ivress under overpowered because this is basically the Skaven version of the High Elves. They, their mechanics are just super good. Being able to ambush attack with a Lithanas faction across all of his armies is really good. Being able to use the Underway stance, really good. The assassination mechanic is really good because you can get a, a boatload of influence very quickly with that. Everything works really well for them, except for one thing. Ulthwan, for some reason, is not pleasant climate, but luckily the High Elves are so robust of a faction that it's not that big of a deal. You can reduce construction costs and increase growth using your heroes and stuff, so it works out quite well. As for Eltharion, using your Batman mechanic of putting people in jail is really powerful, and you've got access to um, some unique units in your roster with the, uh, with the Mistwalker units. 
Uh, you do have a split empire, which can be a bit of a downside, but you don't have to lean into that. So you've got a lot of options available to you in this particular campaign. If you want to pound down on Rom the Paunch in the early stages of the campaign, that will greatly help with getting the other confederations due to the defeat trait being um, extra relations with High Elves. So he's in a really strong position in Total War Warhammer 3. Then we've got uh, Imric, who can be a little bit challenging because he's a fire-based attacker going into the Chaos Dwarf area. I found that his campaign is nowhere near as, near as challenging in Warhammer 3 as it is in 2. So I'm going to put him under average just because his star position. He's kind of isolated and it's just not as rich as Ulthwan. He just doesn't have access to the same tools that they do. And I think that his faction mechanic of, of the dragon hunting is definitely really good, but you'll often find yourself distracted fighting Chaos Dwarfs. Okay, then we've got Corn overpowered. Do I even need to say anything more about Corn? Possibly the most powerful faction in the entire game, but you really need to have a competent player in the command of Corn. Because the, playing as Scarbrand, oh my god, you just. You can just pound down on everyone. He is one of the premier one-man doomstacks in the game. No one can stand up to him in the early stage of the campaign. His tech tree is amazing. You don't have any other legendary lords to confederate, but you just pound down on absolutely everyone. Their roster is so bloody strong. Uh, their mechanic of, of making blood hosts, ridiculously strong. A lot of people say that corn is, is very poor, and oftentimes you will be in the negatives, but don't worry about that. Just kill more. If you're bleeding money, make your enemies bleed more. So just skulls for the skull thrones and just, it works exactly as it should and the more aggressive you are, the better uh, his campaign is. Being able to summon the blood letters at, at will using the, the blood throne mechanic, this is an insanely powerful faction that you can get absurd results very early on. Um, I once got from my starting position all the way to Throt the Unclean by turn 10, just by chaining uh, destruction all the way along. Uh, similar to what he does, but he doesn't have a button to just reset it, so you've got to uh, just keep chaining your victories together. Uh, Scarbrand is insanely powerful. Okay, so Kislev. There are now four Kislevite factions. Confederations with them is an absolute nightmare, with the exception of the Ice Court and the Orthodoxy. Uh, just winning the supporter race with them uh, confederates the others, but confederating these two, they just usually just don't want to confederate. Even if they're in a pretty bad position, they just refuse to confederate, which is such a pain in the ass. Their economy is all right, but you really need a lot of territory in order to snowball their economy. So in the early stages of the campaign, Kislev kind of uh, feels a little bit weak. Uh, you can sort of skip a lot of their roster. They do have some good units in their roster for sure, and they've got powerful legendary lords. Overall, sort of a mid uh, mid-ish to high, mid, mid-high sort of faction. They've got, most of the time, a lot of enemies to deal with. So in terms of the Ice Court, I'm going to put them under strong. I feel like I get really good results out of out of the Ice Court, personally. Whereas I feel like um, the Orthodoxy is average, because, one thing, this one here, plus six extra public order, globally, right from the get-go, is a big deal, especially in the higher campaign difficulty. It just means that you don't need to worry so much about your public order as much, which is very important. Um, and this one here has to deal with Azazel pretty much straight away. And there is a way of getting rid of him very early on, but I feel like the challenges with this one are a little bit higher than with the Ice Court. Although the Ice Court does have to deal with Throth the Unclean and Azag the Slaughterer in the early stage of the campaign. Then you've got Boris Ursus. Boris is underpowered. Boris needs to get the fuck out of the Northern Chaos Waste. He just shouldn't be there. Um, that, his position and his mechanics for that campaign suck. Uh, I highly recommend migrating away from his start position. It's not a good place to be. Even going just to like the northern part of Norska is a better start position than the northern Chaos Ways. I just don't feel like it works very well for him there. You know, starting off with a few Bear Riders is not a compensation for having to deal with Archeon as your early game threat. It's just not a good idea. And as for the um, the Daughters of the Forest, this is a very powerful faction. In fact, I'd go so far as to say as it's overpowered. Because your um, curses and blessings mechanic is very powerful, it's using Grom the Paunch's um, mechanics there. And the other hexes are insanely powerful as well. So you, there's a lot you can do with this campaign, but it's weird. It's such a weird campaign because you're, you don't have access to Hag Witches and you're recruiting Kossars. And you, but you can't recruit Kossars with speed. It's just a very weird campaign. But... I would say that if you know what you're doing, it, this one is actually very overpowered. The stuff that you can do with it, it's insane. 
Okay. Then we've got the Lizardmen. Lizardmen confederations can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, they're very much a stubborn race. They're mostly close together with the exception of Nakai. They're fairly reasonable and, you know, if you join war with their other enemies, they'll usually be friendly with you and they'll kind of band together and help each other out. You know, if, if you're competent with this, it's a, it's a campaign where you need to think about diplomacy, uh, at least among other Lizardmen. So as for Hexwaddle, I don't feel like their faction mechanics are particularly powerful. Starting position is maybe a little bit easier than it was in Warhammer 2. I'm going to put it under average. I don't think there's anything particularly special about Master Mundy. Um, as for Krokka, I think he's got a more challenging start position than Master Mundy, but it's easier than it used to be for him, because it used to take him a lot longer to get going, I and mean, he used to have to butt heads with Clan Morts, which he still kind of does, but it's a lot easier for him now. So I'm, I'm going to put him as average as well. I also feel like his faction bonuses are better. The Cult of Sotek, their campaign is way easier in Warhammer 3 than it was in 2, and using the Sacrifices mechanic, you can essentially have free construction costs for the entirety of your campaign, overpowered obviously there is just so much going for them in that campaign and it's very quickly uh, you can get get this going very quickly with uh, the cold Sotek campaign your initial starting enemy is essentially clan pestilence and they're not that difficult to take out in warhammer 3 compared to what they were in 2. Flakwa Flakwa is not too bad actually I'm going to put them under strong I think they've got a a pretty good start position where they can pound down on their early game green skins and get quite a bit of territory and then they've got um, some friendly guys right next to them and you've got the Order of Lawmasters there as well, which are reasonably friendly. So you can do a fair bit with them. And also your ability to reset your movement is quite useful. And being able to recruit uh, Coadles at Tier 3 compared to Tier 4 is a big benefit, a big edge over the other guys there. It's actually it's surprising how much uh, um, Tlacqua's campaign has really improved. Itza is another... Uh, I wouldn't put it under Overpowered, even though you start off with Croak. I don't think... Yeah, starting with Croak's pretty good. His faction bonuses aren't as good as the Cult of Sotek, though. Mm. Look, I'm going to leave it at strong, but I, like, borderline overpowered. Just because you start off with Croak there, and start off with Itza. And Croak, uh, sorry, uh, Gorok is a very powerful Legendary Lord on his own. Now, as for Nakai the Wanderer, Nakai used to be the biggest pile of shit in the game. And now, he's actually pretty damn good. Now, especially now that he actually has his Croxigals back. Uh, starting off in Cathay is a good start position for you. The, the Vassal actually works quite well because friendly factions no longer declare war on them. So everything in Nakai's faction is finally sort of working out quite well. And if and you get an event as well that happens, allows you to spawn a new army in Lustria. So yeah, Nakai's campaign is, is quite strong. I, I quite like what's going on with Nakai now. And then we've got Oxyodal. Now your early game enemy is is Zinch, which is a bit of a problem, but you've got all the tools that you need at your disposal to do it, and being able to teleport around the map is a big advantage. So I'm going to put um, Oxyodal's campaign as, uh, as strong. Then we've got Norska. Norska used to be the worst race in the game in Warhammer 2. Everything just sucked about them. They couldn't occupy a lot of settlements. The supply lines crippled them. Their economy sucked. Uh, the legendary lords weren't that good. A lot of their units kind of sucked, allowing you to, or forcing you to have to spam only one type of unit. Uh, but Everything has improved greatly for them ever since they became the Warriors of Chaos bitches. It's just, their economy is way better. Their, their, the rest of their roster seems to work a lot better. And now they can occupy every settlement in the game. They don't have to worry about constantly ruin dwelling. And also, supply lines are no longer a huge issue. So when it comes down to Wolfric, I'm actually going to put him under strong. And as for um, Throg, also a strong. Although, I would actually go so far as to say that Throg's campaign is more powerful than than um, Wolfric's because I actually prefer rolling around with physical resistance buffed tro uh, trolls compared to mammoths these days. I just find myself not needing to mammoth spam. But both of the Norsken factions are in a really strong position. Uh, even recruiting Nor uh, Nor like Norsken marauders in the early stages of the campaign, it doesn't feel too bad. Invading the Empire in the early stages of the campaign, not a big deal. So I find I'm able to expand pretty quickly and actually quite enjoy playing as the Norsken factions. So a lot of the issues that I had with them in Warhammer 2, they've been completely resolved. They could certainly use a rework in terms of just making them a bit more entertaining, but they are very strong if you know what you're doing. Then as for Nurgle, underpowered. Yeah, Nurgle... Uh, Kugath Plague Father, it's not working out well for him. His start position is not good. His starting enemy is um, 
is Helm and Gorst, and Nurgle as a faction just moves really slow. The plague mechanic just doesn't really do much for you. It's 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 like a slight annoyance for the AI, but it's a major annoyance if you're the player suffering a plague, because a lot of the AI will just brush aside the the uh, the plagues as not being that important. So he's kind of got the um, a reworked. Grom's Cauldron mechanic as well, just like a stank here. Although I just don't think that the, the Cauldron for the Plague Cauldron for um, Nurgle is particularly good. Luckily, there is a race update coming soon. Hopefully, they do a bit with Nurgle there because it's just it's not really working out too well for Nurgle at the moment. Okay, then we've got the Ogre Kingdoms. The Ogres are not a particular power, uh, popular race at the moment, but I don't think that they're weak. I feel that. Um, Grease's Goldtooth is average. I feel like, yeah, he's in an average position. Um, early game Ogre units are not anything amazing. You have to rely very heavily on camps, but once you get a whole bunch of camps together and they start getting leveling up, uh, you can actually make quite a bit of cash from that. Uh, but it's not the fastest of the campaigns by any means, but I, I think with the Ogres it just feels like they're a half-baked faction. Their late game power is quite high though. Uh, they can't get regular settlements any higher than tier 3, which can be a little bit of an issue. But their garrisons tend to be um, pretty large, although awful in order resolve for some reason. But uh, if you build up your defenses, I find that it's not too difficult to defend them. They also don't have too powerful of an enemy. This one does have to deal with Grimgore Ironhide. But I find that if you can manage to overcome that, everything else is quite easy. And then you've got Scrag the Slaughterer, who I think his start position, is, well, his uh, overall campaign projection is quite strong. I feel like he's in a better position than Grease's Goldtooth, uh, due to the, the ease of moving around in that general area, and the enemies being kind of easier to deal with. So you get to plunder a bit more, which makes you more money, which allows you to do more things. And you've also got better defeat traits in the area. So one thing that really helps the Ogres is getting Thorgrim uh, Grudgebearer's defeat trait, for getting extra research rate, because the the ogre tech tree is really important since it activates more um, uh, camps for you. You really want to get as many camps as possible. So those are the ogres there. In terms of confederations, I didn't find their ability to confederate each other too difficult. It really just matters of catching them with their pants down a little bit. Now, Skaven. Skaven have always been a very powerful race. They're probably not quite as powerful in Warhammer 3 as they were in 2, but they also don't need to be because the enemies are not as powerful either, like the AI. But overall, the Skaven are very powerful. I'm going to put Clan Moors as strong, Clan Pestilens as strong, Clan Rictus as strong, Clan Scryer as... Uh, no, of course, I'm going to put them as overpowered. Being able to use nuclear warheads and have unlimited ammunition on your rattling guns, plus you start off with Skaven Blight. Yeah, and you've got Ikaclaw, very powerful legendary lord. Yeah, of course they're going to end up as overpowered. Now, Eshin is also overpowered because Shadowy Dealings is just so insane. Being able to wipe out an entire faction with the click of your fingers, being able to Thanos snap them like that, is insane. So, very powerful faction mechanic there, and you've got very powerful um, Eshin units because they've all got armor piercing, so this is a really, really powerful faction there. And then you got Clan Mulder, also overpowered. The mutation mechanic, being able to have basically walking nukes with your cellular instability, being able to augment so many units in your roster quite easily. And then also the mechanic giving you free units throughout your campaign, insanely powerful. And also Hell Pit is a really good start position. Taking on Kislev in the early stages of the campaign is, is quite easy because they're just, it's just like meat for the slaughter, I guess. So that works out quite, pretty well for them. Overall, the Skaven are in a really good position, uh, that, which they have usually been in, because ambushing your enemies, most of the time you're going up against enemies that have a lot of missile units. Ambushing them is always going to work out well. All the legendary lords are quite powerful. Tretch Craventail isn't quite as bad as he used to be, and he's actually in a much better start position than he used to be as well. Uh, Nagaroth didn't really make much sense, so being in the Darklands there makes much, much better sense. And you've got easy pick and dwarfs to go and fight. Uh, so overall, the Skaven are in a really strong position, but I don't think anyone's going to be particularly surprised by that. Then we've got Nakari. I'm going to put Nakari as... Ooh, I'm going to put him as strong. Uh, borderline overpowered, because Disciple armies are really bloody good, but starting in Ulth 1 does mean you've got a lot of powerful enemies to begin with, and that can give some people a bit of a hard time. Uh, then once you've moved from that area... 
Yeah, it, it can be a bit challenging with Nakari because getting vassals in that area, they, they'll they still hate you because you are just a demon and it, it's just it's just a very weird campaign for sure, uh, which I think that's, that's what it's supposed to be. But your early game roster is also a little bit weak, very squishy. Um, so you need to be pretty good at microing in order to get good results out of Nakari. I do get sent in quite a few disasters with them, but if you know what you're doing, you can get amazing results out of Nakari for sure. But I just don't think they really belong in, in Overpowered, nor do they belong in Average. Okay, as for Tomb Kings, Tomb Kings is a middle of the wrong sort of faction. They cannot confederate under any circumstance, which is definitely a downside for them. Their economy is way better in Warhammer 3 than it was in 2. Um, they're, they're definitely a fun faction to play, but then they've never been a particularly powerful faction. So I'm going to put Kemri as average, because it takes them a really long time to get going. And like I said, that's the main thing we're judging this criteria on. But, you know, once once they do enter the late campaign, they can really project their power out, but it takes a long time to get to that point. Um, the Exiles of Nehek, they've actually got quite a bit of a benefit in Warhammer 3 because the Mortuary Cult stuff costs less. So their later stage campaign stuff is way better than it used to be because you can actually get more armies with them than any of the other ones. Of course, if you get into the insane late campaign. Uh, then you've got uh, the Court of Libaris. I think that this is a little bit on the weak side there. Star position being a minor settlement and playing Ring Around the Rosie with the Silver Host is a big problem. I really think they need to take a, a look at... Um, in fact, I'd even go so close as almost putting it under underpowered, but I think that she's got the worst position out of all of the Tomb Kings. And as for Ark in the Black, I actually think he's got the strongest start position out of the Tomb Kings because he starts off with an extra army to begin with, and that is a big deal because you're able to... Your army... Uh, your, your units you have in the early stage of the campaign with Tomb Kings, they suck. You're mostly spamming basic skeletons, and if you're only able to recruit one army... Going up against another army, the full stack, you'll oftentimes, just by raw power, lose. So having two armies of garbage is a big advantage. So oftentimes with uh, these other guys, you have to rely very heavily on the the one special unit that you've got, whether that be your, your lord or, or a specific unit. Okay, then we've got Kairos Fate Weaver. So Kairos' campaign is interesting because his mechanics are very powerful, but so are his enemies. So I'm going to put him under strong, but also with a caveat saying that this is a tough campaign. But once you get over that initial hurdle of dealing with the Order of Lawmasters, Oxyodal, Tlaqua, and, <laughs> and the Last Defenders, once you've done that, the world is yours. They basically got like cheat codes to win the campaign, so it's a very slow start, but then you just a powerhouse uh, in the later stage of the campaign because of how powerful your roster is, your your lords are, and your overall mechanic is very powerful. And then we've got the Deceivers, which um, there should be a tier above Overpowered where it just says, this faction cheats. <laughs> this faction, you cannot lose in, this fa in the Deceivers. You just can't lose the campaign. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do in this campaign. You can't lose. Unless you deliberately try to lose, and that's... Again, that's that's a player choice to do that. You just can't lose your campaign. If you lose your army, no big deal. Um, if a settlement gets blown out, no big deal. You but just can't lose your Trickster's Cults. And so your campaign will only ever get stronger as time goes on. And you can hit critical mass so quickly, even quicker even than, um, than Torox. By far the most overpowered faction in the game currently, which is pretty typical for a, a DLC that just came out. But yeah, super overpowered. Oh, what do you know? The three friggin' legendary lords that just got introduced, they're all overpowered. How about that? Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Anyway, so Vampire Coast, another race that can't confederate, which is a little bit of a problem for them um, in terms of just their overall power projection. But they've got some decent units. They've got some really crappy units, but at least they're cheap. But some very powerful units later down the, the track. They've got some good faction mechanics for them, and their economy is pretty good. I'm going to put the Awakened, so Luther Harkon. I'm going to put him under Strong. Uh, the um, the Dreadfleet, I'm actually going to put that under Overpowered, because th being able to um, recruit spam <laughs> tons of... of uh, uh, Necrofex Colossus fairly early on. It, later than you could have in Warhammer 2, but still pretty early on, is a big deal. Uh, he's still just an absolute powerhouse, plaguing Ulthuan there. Uh, the Sartosa, so that's um, Aranessa Saltspite, I think that she is actually weak. 
I'm not a big fan of her situation or her as a legendary lord. I just think not much going on for her there. And and um, what's it called? Um, Silostra, so, uh, D D Dirifan, <laughs> Dirifan, whatever. Uh, I think she's actually really quite strong. I'm going to put her under there because uh, she really benefits from physical resistance and she is able to give Nagareth a good pounding really early on because he's too busy fighting Karen Carr. So you're in a really good position with uh, with that faction. Okay, then we're talking about the Vampire Cast. Now you notice that there are two Vampire... It's two Von Karsteins here, or Sylvania. Uh, one's for Vlad, one's for Isabella because uh, it's the only faction in the game that has two... Legendary Lord choices, although there's not much difference between them. So Vampire Accounts are stupidly strong, but in my opinion, kind of a boring faction. Um, economy is really strong. Their early game roster sucks, but you just spam shitloads of them, so you just have numbers. Their Lords are really strong. The heroes are really strong. They have a lot of enemies, but it just kind of works for you anyway. So it, they're just a stupidly strong faction. I'm going to put the Drakenhof Conclave as probably overpowered because the books of Nagash for them just really work out well and you'll start, it's just such an easy campaign, it's ridiculously easy you you hit critical mass almost straight away with, with uh, Manfred then you've got um, the Barrow Le no sorry, yeah that's the Barrow Legion I think they're strong but it takes them a little bit longer than the Drakenhof Conclave uh, Vlad von Karstein and Isabella I think they're both actually in a strong position uh, being in the Empire, you've got to be a little bit careful about what goes on, because everyone around you hates you, but you are strong enough to deal with it. So that's for both uh, Vlad and Isabella there. And then you've got the Caravan of Blue Roses, which I'm also going to put as strong. Then you've got the, uh, excuse me, the Warriors of Chaos here. Very powerful faction. The rework works amazing for them, but there are definitely some outliers in here. Archaon is overpowered he's one of the the one of two that can confederate all of the other uh warriors of chaos legendary lords the other one being bellicor i personally feel like bellicor's campaign is slightly stronger than archaeon's but archaeon's moves quicker to begin with but i think that bellicor being able to use teleport uh using rifts around the map it gives him an edge over archaeon but these are two incredibly powerful factions they are absolute powerhouses in the hands of the player uh then we've got um Heralds of the Tempest with uh, with Kolek Sanida. I think he's very strong. You know, being able to make him essentially a one-man absolute bulldozer by getting a few vassals is absolutely insane. The amount of mass that he can get just bowls over anything other than monster units, essentially. So he becomes absolutely massive. Then we've got Sigvald the Magnificent. I think he's in a really strong position. You got amazing rosters, good mechanics, a lot of money, good legendary lord. Bit of a problem, though, that you can't um, confederate. And also, you've got the Gifts of Slanesh giving you souls, which is uh, very good. Same thing with Azazel. These two campaigns are pretty damn similar. Although, uh, this one uses the Undivided Tech Tree, where this one uses the Slanesh-specific Tech Tree. I don't think that makes a big difference, though. Then you've got um, Festus, also in a strong position. Festus is a really good Legendary Lord. And I think that Nurgle actually works really well as in Nurgle magic and Nurgle units, works really well within the Warriors of Chaos. It's just a shame that the Nurgle stuff doesn't work so well for Nurgle, in my opinion. Uh, he uses the exact same uh, campaign mechanic as well as uh, Kugath Plague Father with the Plague Cauldron, but I think it works... I, I, actually, I don't think you need it as much with uh, Festus as you do with uh, with uh, Kugath. And then you've got Valkyrie the Bloody, also strong campaign. The Warriors of Chaos are just in an insanely good position in Total Warhammer 3, and then you've got Village the Cursling, also strong. All of the Warriors of Chaos are in an insanely strong position. Then you've got the Wood Elves. So Wood Elves is not too difficult to confederate, usually it's based on a mission. Um, Dryker is, the is in the worst position with these, because Dryker can't confederate the Sisters of Twilight or, or um, Orion, but everyone else can confederate everyone else. Okay, so, and now that also means you can get Coadil because she actually recruits Coadil now as the AI. So you can actually get all four of the legendary lords and two of the legendary heroes, that being Ariel and Coadil. So I think that Orion is actually overpowered. They haven't gotten rid of his... <laughs> it's, it's weird, I used to say he was absolute crap. Um, being able to declare war on someone and reduce your global upkeep cost is insane. So he is in one of the strongest positions in the game if you decide to play into that mechanic. So that's super powerful. 
Uh, as for um, as for Argualon, I think that uh, Dothu's in a strong position. I played a campaign with him, and he's, he's in a strong position. But yeah, nothing compared to this. I think that the Sisters of Twilight, they are actually, they're kind of overpowered. They're really bloody powerful. They're one of the strongest legendary lords in the game in the early stages of the campaign, and that's, of course, when it matters the most. So you're in a really strong position there. And Dryka, I'm going to put Dryka as average. She's got some really good things going, like getting access to Treeman by Tier 3 is really good, but she doesn't have many friends, and I think that's a big deal. And she's not able to just instantly confederate as easily, and she's the, also the only one that doesn't start off with the Oak of Ages, whereas the other ones do start off with it, allowing you to get those confederations very early on and expand without having to fight, whereas Dryka has to fight to get what's hers, and everything around her doesn't really make her much money, so... It's, I think it's a bit slower of a campaign than with the others, but she's still in a pretty good position. But anyway, that's my faction strength ranking tier list based on, of course, how quickly they can reach critical mass. These ones here reaching it very quickly, and these ones here reaching it the slowest. Uh, so I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Don't forget to check out Manscaped. The link will be in the description. In the, sorry, in the description. I appreciate you guys, and we'll see you next time. Later, guys.